Welcome everyone here and online. God is moving. We can see it every day. And just want to remind everybody that next Sunday, we're going to have two services for Easter, 9 and 1030. I will be in the back. Uh, If you would like to get a little electronic flyer from me to pass to your friends, uh, Pastor made that. I would like to uh, send that to as many people as possible. If we don't ask they will not come. That's right. So I encourage you to invite everybody um, that you think uh, needs it, and we all need it. So I'd like to uh, turn to 2 Corinthians uh, chapter 9 and verse 7. Every man according as his purposeth in his heart, so let him give, not grudgingly or of necessity, for God loveth a cheerful giver. I'd like to invite uh, folks up for our offering and tithes. Heavenly Father, 
Uh, we are so grateful for who you are. We are so grateful that you have given us so many blessings. Let us take this time to give to you, to your church, to extend your kingdom. Let us do that cheerfully. And may you bless this offering and tithes and let it come back to us 30, 60, 100 fold. It is through your son and our savior Jesus that we pray. Amen. Please stand and let's pray. Father, we thank you for this time that we've gathered in your house. I pray that you'll move among your people. I ask God that each of us would lay aside our distractions and the cares of life and help us focus on you. We've come to worship you today. And may our worship be meaningful. May it come from the depths of who we are, crying out to the depths of who you are. Meet with your people and meet every person at the point of their need. In Jesus' name, amen.
of the glory all the hour Lord we lift our hands in worship as we lift your holy name you deserve the glory all the hour we lift our hands in worship as we lift your in the room, I, I come to worship you today. I want you to bow your head right where you're at, just a moment, please. I want you to ask the Lord to do something in your life today. God, we've come today, and there are people with needs, there are people facing things in their mind, in their body, and in their spirit. And we believe you do miracles, God. So I pray, God, that you'll do them in this building today. I ask, Lord, that you would heal the sick and save the lost. Reclaim those who have walked away from the Father and have backslidden. Move among your people, I ask. Touch every heart, touch every life. Lift us, I pray, in Jesus' name. You may be seated. Children, you can be dismissed at this time, and you can follow Miss Stephanie. She's going to lead you to Children's Church. We're thankful. Let's thank God for our children today, and let's bless them as they go. There's an old song that I grew up hearing, singing. My, it was probably one of my mother's favorite songs. Every time she ever heard it, she would shout and praise God. And uh, I was thinking about this song the other day. I've sung it once or twice, uh, only once here, probably a couple, couple times in my whole life. But I just wanted to sing a little bit of it. And go ahead, my brother. <laughs>
We've got a few people that's going to be baptized. And uh, so you see we've got the, the watering trough. Jesus was born in the barn. You're going to be baptized in a feeder. I, I really love right now and enjoy the simplicity of our church. I like that. I think, I think... And let me just say this, I think that in a large way in America, Sunday morning has become too much of a show. And we've got way too many things going on. I think sometimes we need to cut it back and be a little more simple in our approach. <clears throat> Can you say amen? We've made everything the focus but him. But we're going to baptize some people in a little bit. Again, don't forget next Sunday, Easter Sunday, 9 o'clock, 1030. Bring somebody. People will go on Easter when they'll not go any other time. And I believe we can fill this church up twice next Sunday. And uh, we've been seeing significant growth, a lot of new people coming, and a lot of people staying, and we're excited about that. So we're going to, for a little while... I don't know how long, maybe a few months, six months. We'll try it and see. We'll do two services. If that continues to work and continues to fill up, we'll stick with it. But uh, we'll, we'll try it for a little while and go to two services. And that gives people the opportunity to invite. Uh, last Sunday, uh, we were so full. and Just a regular Sunday, people parking in the grass. And that won't continue. What will happen is what you see. They'll, they'll back off. If they pull in this lot and there's nowhere to park, how many know they'll just pull right back out? Say amen. And uh, so we're going to make room for them. We need to make room for everybody. Luke chapter 22, and I'm going to preach for just a few moments from this one verse. Luke <clears throat> chapter 22 and verse 54. Would you stand, please, and let us reverence the word of God as it is read. <clears throat> Luke 22, verse 54, Then they took him and led him and brought him into the high priest's house. And Peter, and Peter followed afar off. And Peter followed afar off. I'd like to ask a question today. How close are you? How close are you? Are you following? And, and, and just how close are you following? Father, I pray that you would move upon me today. God, I just ask that you would come with an unction and anointing to preach. God, somehow will you take these, these fragmented thoughts and, and pull them together, and these, this stammering tongue, and speak. 
that, that people can hear it and understand it and by the Holy Spirit receive it. I pray, God, that all of us will follow you all the way. In Jesus' name, amen, amen. You may be seated. I ask again, are, are, are you following Jesus today? And how close are you? How close are you to, to God, to Christ? In Jesus' day, the spirit of the Antichrist was at a high tide, just like in ours. Jesus come and they did not they did not get what they wanted of him. Even the disciples were somewhat disenchanted at times. Because you understand that the, the call of Christ has always been the same. He's never shirked it. He's never drawn back. He's never put things in fine print. No, it's, it's always been the same. The call that was on, on his life is on ours. We live sometimes with this erroneous idea that's been perpetrated by ungodly theologians that Christ came to earth with two plans, plan A and plan B and E. Plan A didn't quite work out for him, so he resorted to the next one. And I've heard that at times from different sources. And I want you to know, and those of you that are online, in this little assembly that's gathered, that's as far from the truth as anything can be. Jesus, when he left heaven, he came for one purpose. He did a lot of great things. He performed miracles, but that's not why he came. He preached the gospel of the kingdom, but that's not why he came. He taught people the, uh, the ways of living a righteous life, but that's not why he came. And all those are, are important. He called disciples and he, he groomed them for what he wanted them to do when he left, but that's not the purpose he came. He came for one purpose, and that was to die on a cruel cross. And we are approaching this season where we celebrate and come Friday, uh, Good Friday, we will celebrate a whole day where we recognize that the single solitary purpose that Jesus left heaven was to come and take your sin and my sin to the cross. That is the purpose. But man had another purpose. You see it throughout the Gospels. And you see them even trying to refute Christ. In John chapter 6, it, it, it says in verse 15 that they were even going to make him a king. Now there's a big error in this. Making Jesus a king. What do you mean, preacher? You don't make him king. He's already king. But they wanted to make their kind of king. The Jews, they, they were looking for a conqueror. They were looking for one who would, uh, gleaming armor, midday sun, white steed, pull the sword uh, and overthrow the Roman Empire. They, they were looking for that great military leader. They thought they had him. I mean, think about it. He could take just a few men because if they died, he can raise them from the dead. If they're hungry, he can take two fish and five loaves and feed 5,000. We got our guy. He can solve everything. We're always looking for a guy to solve everything. We're looking for a guy in America to solve everything. He doesn't exist. No matter who you get as president, he's not going to solve everything. There's only one Savior. They, they, they're looking for this conquering king. There was one place where Jesus was very clear with the disciples when he said, I have to go to Jerusalem. The scribes and the Pharisees are going to brutalize me. 
and they're going to kill me. And Peter said, oh no, Lord, don't talk that way. That's not true. That, far be it from you. And Jesus looked at Peter and said, get behind me, Satan. Don't you get in the way of my purpose. So you start to peel back the veil a little bit and you're starting to see here why the disciples were following him at first. And anybody else? They thought this is the time. When Jesus came the first time, they were looking for a conquering king, not a suffering lamb. They wanted right in conquest, overthrow Rome. Man, we've got our king. This is going to be great. But he always rejected that and he always went against that and it never seemed to work out for them the way they wanted it. And uh, when they came to take Jesus, it's so interesting, when they come to take him, to crucify him, they're going to try him illegally. They're going to testify against him. They're going to do all these things. This week, this is the Passion Week, and that's, that's what they're going to do. And when they come and they're leading him away, the Bible says that Peter followed Far off. You know, I wrestled this week with what to preach on Palm Sunday. There's so many sermons to preach on this day, and I, I wrestled. God kept me, bringing me back to this. Because there's so many people that they follow. But it's you're a Christian. Well, yeah. Well, I mean, I I go to church occasionally. I mean, I've read the Bible, but I mean, don't tag me as one of those radical Christians. I'm not, you know. I'm not like a. I'm not overboard. Don't call me one of those radical Christians. Can I ask you a question? Is there any other kind? No. Is there any other kind than a radical Christian? Is there any other kind than those that would say, I'm going to follow him all the way? Not part way. Not a casual, convenient Christianity, that's the brand. The last 30 years, 40 years that we've sold in America. I remember, I remember when it started happening. I'm old enough to remember, and don't anybody say a thing. I'm old enough to remember. I remember going to the church growth conferences and them saying things like this. Listen, you can't require too much of people. We're fastly coming to a time in America that if you're going to build a church, don't ask too much. Uh, you know, maybe a few minutes on Sunday morning. Don't get too strong in your preaching. You've got to be more entertainment, entertainment value. And they started selling all these things that you had to do to build a church. I remember in that conference, I was part of it all. And I got up out of my seat. And in the middle of that man saying that took all the books and all the pamphlets that they had given me and I threw them in the trash on the way out and said, God, I'll never go that route because that's not the Bible route. That's not the Calvary route. That's not what you said. And I'm not going to go this way in America. But what we have done, we have in America sold this bill of goods And we have become great marketers and businessmen and it's all about what does the person want. Let's just get them in the seat. Convenient. I call it 7-Eleven Christianity. 
I'll follow him when he's doing what I want. I'll follow him when he touches my body, heals my mind, fills my pocketbook, puts food in my cupboard, gives me a brand new Cadillac to drive and nice clothes to wear or whatever else I want. When he's doing everything I want, then I'll follow him. But when things don't go my way, well, he's failed me. I'm just out. I don't believe this thing works. God is no good. I'm preaching better than this little crowd's letting on. I hope somebody online saying amen right now. You do get it that God never shirked it, that this thing is not convenience oriented, it's consecration. All through the Old Testament, it was the sacrifice on the altar. When Jesus explodes on the scene, his inception was this. If any man will come after me, let him deny himself, take up his cross, and follow me daily. And he would say things like that. Hate your father, hate your mother, hate your life, give everything up. Go all the way with me. If a man puts his hand to the plow and looks back, he's not fit for my kingdom. If he won't follow me all the time, then he can't follow me any of the time, Jesus was saying. When the rich young ruler come to him and he said, I, 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 how do I get into your kingdom? How do I make it? He said, well, have you kept the law? I've kept the law from my youth. Jesus didn't dispute him. But then Jesus said, do this. Sell everything you have and give it to the poor and follow me. The man walked away sorrowfully. You know what screams at me? Jesus didn't chase him. He didn't beg him. He didn't say, well, I, I, I guess I went for too much. No. He said, let him go. Jesus will not beg anybody to follow him. Amen. Amen. Well, I figured I might as well just go ahead and weed the garden today. <laughs> Do you hear me? understand, when you come to this church, you're not, you're not coming to be entertained. That's not what I'm here for. When you come here, we are going to hear the undefiled, unmolested, pure word of the living God. And Jesus never shirked it at all. But he always said, if you're going to follow me, it's going to be consecration. He would say to the disciples, I'm going to the cross. I don't want to hear that. No way. Uh -uh. No, let's not go there. He never, ever deviated and I'll be around when, when, it's, when it works out for me when it fits my schedule there was another guy said something like that he said I just got married I, I just can't you know got, got too many things another guy said well I, you know I'm running this business I just don't have time for God Right now, when I get a little more time, I'll follow him. I got too many other things going on. It's all through the Bible these things happen. But Jesus never deviated. He didn't say, well, okay, I understand. It's interesting. He never said that. He never said, oh, well, okay, I get it. Sunday morning's your only day to sleep in. If I've heard that once, I've heard it 10,000 times. You know what I say to people that say to me, Sunday morning is my only morning to sleep in? Just go right ahead and sleep in then. I ain't begging nobody to come to this church. I ain't begging nobody. You Listen, the bottom line is a man's either going to follow Jesus or if he's not. And if he's not willing to follow him, he certainly ain't going to follow me. If he won't go to church because God wants him to, he ain't going to go because Troy wants him to. I just hit that one. I nailed that one. Come on. That deserves an amen right there. there ain't nobody going to do it for me. If you won't do it for God, you'll never do it for me. I can beg and plead and cry. I wish you'd come. No, it's not going to work. And that's not my job. It's not my job to build a church. It's not my job to make sure you come. It's my job to preach the gospel. And then it's up to you to decide whether you're going to do it or whether you're not going to do it. That's your job. Amen, Amen brother. Keep it going. Hallelujah. 
Jesus didn't beg and I won't beg. But what he did do was call all men. He didn't coax, he didn't coddle, he called and he commanded. And the Bible is still the same and the clarion voice of Christ still rings through the annals of human history. It's still the same. If you want to follow me, lay down your life. Give it all up. Cough it all up. Say, Lord, I'm, I want you more than anything else in this world and I'll follow you all the way to the end. My whole life belongs to you. My whole life. Finally got a good preaching out of somebody. But what did Peter, but what did Peter do? He followed her far off. Do you, do you know why? Do you know why he followed that way? Because he's still holding out that there's going to be 10,000 angels and a yeah. war take place and they're going to overthrow Rome. He's still holding out it's going to go his way. Yeah. Now, if you haven't heard anything else I preach, get this. This is the truth. He wanted to be close enough to be included, but far enough away to not get indicted. I want to be close enough just in case it all works out the way I want it to. But far enough away that when I'm at work and someone says you're a Christian, <laughs> you know, I mean, I mean, yeah, I mean, I, I believe that, you know, in God. I'm really telling you something right now. I love you so much. I love you so much. I'm willing to tell you the truth. We, we so many people are just like that. They, they're so, they're, they're following, but it's just far off. Close enough. I want to be included if it happens. If the angels show up and the sword is drawn and we start overthrowing Rome and woo, we're having a time when things go great, then I can run up here and say, oh yeah, I'm with him. But then when the angels didn't show up and the sword wasn't drawn and Rome is still in power and the Jews are getting ready to crucify Jesus, Peter dips into the darkness and says, hmm, hmm, it's not going my way. And someone says, hey, I think I've seen you with him. Not me. You didn't see me. No, I'm not. No, no, not me. Someone else, a little bit later, Peter's still outside and he's looking around, he's hiding. And someone says, you're one of them. You, you were with Jesus. No, not me, he said. Not me. And then a little bit later, he's warming himself by the fire and this little old lady walks up and she says, I've seen you with him. And he began to cuss like a drunken sailor. It doesn't say it that way in the King James Version. <laughs> but he began to cuss like a drunken sailor to mask who he really was. And pretend he wasn't with Jesus. Far enough away that they can't, they can't pin it on me. But close enough that if it goes that way, I can say, oh yeah, I'm right here beside him. Most of us, that's how, that's, that's how we follow God. Close enough if he does everything our way. But far enough away that if it doesn't go our way, you can't really pin me down. Uh-uh. You can't pin me down. But the call is still the same. And the call was the same for Peter. That same guy that followed Jesus afar off, the same guy that tucked in the crowd, same guy that cussed and tried to mask that he was a follower of Christ, that same guy said, I'm done, I give up, I quit. I'm going back to the boat. I'm going back to what I know, I'm going back to the world. 
I'm going back to the life of sin. I'm done with this thing. And you remember he went back to the boat. He's on the boat and he's fishing. Jesus is resurrected at this point. He's on the boat and he's fishing. The Bible says he's naked. I want to tell you, you don't get more backslidden than being naked on a boat. That's backslid. If someone leaves church and says, I'm done with this, and this afternoon you see him on a boat naked, you know they backslid. <laughs> I'm really preaching the truth right now. He denied the Lord three times. He cussed like a drunken sailor. Now he's out on the boat fishing and he's naked. This is all in your Bible. He said, I'm going back to what I know. Cussing, naked, fisherman. I'm having a good time whether anybody else is or not. I have no idea. I'm enjoying myself. And suddenly Jesus is on the shore and he's cooking fish. And there's Peter out and he sees him. And the Bible says that Peter jumped out of the boat into the water and said, throw me my coat. If I'd have been there, I'd have said, uh-uh. <laughs> throw me my coat. And they threw his coat down. And the Bible says he swam in and covered himself and stood before the Lord. And Jesus looked at Peter and he said, do you love me? Oh, yeah, Jesus. I love you. He answered like he was a good friend. Oh, yeah, I love you. Jesus said, I didn't ask whether you're my friend. You want to hang out on Friday night and watch a movie. That's how he answered him. Oh, I love you like a friend. Yeah, you're my friend. No, do you love me? And then he said, Peter, do you love me more than these? pointed at the fish. What he was really saying to Peter, not just the fish, he was saying, look at me. He was saying, do you love me more than the, this life? Do you love me more than where you come from? Do you love me more than what you've had? Do you love me more than where you've been? Do you love me more than the rudiments of this world? Do you love me more than money? Do you love me more than fame? Do you love me more than prestige? Do you love me more than houses and more than lands? Do you love me more than this life? Do you love me more than your family? More than your kids? More than your money? More than your breath? Do you love me more than everything else? Do you love me more than this world, Peter? Do you love me? He asked him. Amen. I'm not asking, do you want to spend 30 minutes on Sunday morning eating donuts, drinking coffee, getting mad at the preacher and talking about him over lunch? I'm asking you, do you love me? Amen. I'm preaching a lot right now. Amen. I know some of you think I've lost my mind. I did a long time ago. Actually, you can't lose what one never had. Maybe I never had a mind. But I lost the mind that I did have and I have found the mind of Christ. Because let me testify to you. I've made up my mind. I love him more than this world. I love him more than money. I love him more than fame. I love him more than prestige. I love him more than the home that I live in. I love him and I'll follow him all the way. I love him more than this world. I love the Lord. Amen. Woo! I can't help myself. I've been criticized for getting excited about Jesus, but people get excited about a lot less. Amen. Huh? Some of you spent hours this week getting excited over ball games. And I got nothing against the ball games. And I hope your team wins. Someone asked me, said, do you have a bracket? I said, I do not, never have one. Who are you rooting for? I said, it really doesn't matter to me. And I know some of you are having a bad time right now because you're UK fans and you've got a terrible attitude. You haven't been able to worship God this morning. UK done destroyed your bracket. You've been cussing for days saying that man never should coach there again. Get rid of Calipari. Get him out. Don't let him come back to town. They're going to run him out on a rail. Get him out of Dodge. I know what's going on. I know everyone's concerned about that. It don't make a difference to me whether Kentucky wins or loses. 
People lose their minds. Some of you have spilled popcorn and chips and pop on your carpet, uh, carrying on and screaming at the TV and acting like a fool. Let me tell you something this morning. I'm all for it. Go ahead and do it. And you can carry on all you like. But this morning, I'm thrilled and I'm excited and I've come to worship my king and testify about the fact that one day he picked me up. One day he redeemed my soul. One day he washed me in his his blood. One day he wrote my name in heaven. I'm his and he is mine and I'm excited in the fact that I'm following my Lord all the way from earth to heaven. I want to follow him. Oh, glory to God. I love Jesus. Do you, you love me, Peter, more than these? Do you love me more than this world? He said, yeah. In a moment of brokenness, I failed you, Lord. But I'm not worried about the fact that you failed me. And by the way, we've all failed him. Have you ever failed him? Yeah. Have you ever sinned? Yeah. Come on, be honest. <laughs> yes, we all have. In fact, Jesus even said to Peter before all this, you're going to sin. You're going to deny me. He said, but I have prayed that you that your faith not fail. I think it's interesting that he never even said to Peter, I'm not praying you don't fail. I'm just praying that after you fail, after you fall, you get back up. Amen. Come on. He never prays that we won't fail. He already knows you're going to make a mess of it. Huh? He already knows we're going to make a mess of it. But I'm so glad that when we're on the bottom, he doesn't leave us there, does he? He'll cook the fish on the shore and he'll say, put your coat on and get in here because I don't want to stare at your naked body. But get on in here and let's get things right. Do you love me, Troy Irvin? Yes, I love you, Lord. Then here's what's going to happen, he said to Peter. He said, they're going to lead you away the way they led me away. In other words, he told Peter right then, you're going to die on a cross. And you know what Peter did? He's still holding on to the flesh. He's going to go with him, but he says, okay, I got you. Now, I'm paraphrasing a little bit, but he says, all right, Lord, I get it. I'm going to die for you. He said, I think I can accept that. I don't know when it's going to happen, but I'll go for it. But what about John? I know he's your favorite. <laughs> Senior Bible, what about John? What about him? Is he going to do the same? Does he have to do that? Do we not do that? Yeah. We come to church and say, well, I'm better. Lord, but look at them and look at her over there. And I, well, I saw, I know what they did. Come on, yeah. I know this isn't pretty preaching, but man, it is the truth. Amen. That's what we do. Amen. Well, what about John? You know what Jesus said? I love this. Jesus looks at him and he says, you don't worry about John. Peter, you follow me. Amen. I'll take care of John. You just mind your own business and follow me. Amen. History tells us, not the Bible, but legend tells us that when they did lead, lead Peter away to kill him, he said, I'm not worthy to die as my Savior did. Crucify me upside down. And legend and history records that Peter died upside down for his Lord. He went from following afar off, denying the Lord, to on the day of Pentecost, stepping out in front of thousands of people and looked at the Jewish council and said, you killed him, and God raised him from the dead, and one of these days the moon's going to turn to blood and the stars are going to rattle out of their sockets and come to this earth, and he's going to come back. And they looked at Peter and said, what do we do with what you're saying? He said, repent and be baptized. That man went from following afar off to going all the way with God. Amen. You know what? That gives me hope. If Peter can go from following afar off to following Jesus all the way, that means you can, that means I can. Amen. Yeah. Huh? Amen. So I ask you today, I ask you today, are you following Jesus? And even better, how close are you? There's a lot going on. I've got to quit. We're going to baptize some people in just a moment. But there's a lot going on. I'm going to, I'm going to probably preach about some of this stuff here at the beginning of next month. But there's a lot going on. We're living in the last days. If there were ever a day 
that we needed to nestle up close to Jesus, we're living in those moments. Amen. When it all goes down, and when the world turns against Israel, and when things go awry in this world, when, all, when it all happens, it's going to take more than a convenient, oriented Christian that shows up for a few minutes on Sunday morning and, and says, boy, I wish service wasn't so long. It's going to take those that say, listen, I've died out to myself, and I'm going all the way with Jesus Amen. to make it. Amen. Come on. The same kind of world they lived in is the same kind of world we're living in. They lived in a world that killed Jesus. And we're living in a world that hates Christianity. Hates us. Even in America. We're hated. But let me just say, I'm not ashamed of the gospel. For it is the power of God unto salvation. And I'm not ashamed to say I'm a Christian. I'm not ashamed to say I'm a follower of Jesus. I'm not ashamed to tell you that Jesus is Lord and King. And he's coming back Amen. real soon. Amen. I'm not ashamed of that. There's so many places to go in my mind. And so many things that I wanted to share with you that I never got to in this message. And I, I suppose I've never felt such an onslaught against me as I have this morning in the realm of the Spirit. Because there are people here that need to make up your mind. You're going with God. I mean, the time for falling afar off and just on the outskirts and I'm not sure. Listen, that's got to be over. This is the day that you have to decide, I'm going to follow him. Here's what we're going to do before we baptize. Without 15 verses, I'm just going to sing through an old chorus of a song. In fact, won't you go to the guitar real quick. I'm going to sing through an old chorus. You'll know this song, probably the key of D or E flat. You probably like D better. But I want you to hit the key of D real quick. And here's what we're going to do. Everybody look at me. Here's what we're going to do. If you're here today and you would say, Preacher, Today, I'm going to settle the question. I'm going to make up my mind to follow him. And here's my first step. I'm going to get up. I know this is brave. This is bold. They tell you not to do this anymore. But you're going to get up out of your seat and say, I'm going to come and I'm going to kneel at this altar. And I'm going to say, Jesus, my life belongs to you. If that's you today, without a moment's hesitation as I sing, I have decided to follow Jesus. How about you? I have decided to follow Jesus. How about you? You coming? I have decided to follow Jesus. No turning back. Come on. No turning back. Just kneel behind him. I have decided to follow Jesus. Kneel at the front seat if you need to. I have decided to follow Jesus. I have decided. How about it today? To follow no turning back no turning back if none go with me still I will follow if none go My family, my friends, don't go with me. Still I will follow. No turning back. No turning back. Jesus, I thank you for what you're doing in this place. I praise you, Lord. 
I thank you, Jesus. Here's what I want you to pray. I just want you to pray, Lord, I ask you to cleanse my heart of everything that's unlike you. Jesus, I come to you today saying that I will follow you all the way and never turn back. I will follow you, Jesus. What you want for my life is what I want. I will follow you, Jesus. I surrender to your, your Lordship. I have decided to follow you. God, I thank you and I praise you. I anoint this man with the oil that is a type of the Holy Spirit. You said that you could come with a need, even in our body. If there's any sick among you, call for the elders, anoint their head with oil, and the prayer of faith shall save the sick. God, as a testimony of your power and a testimony of your grace, I pray that you'll move in healing power in this man, this man that's going to follow you, this man that's going to testify of you. Move, I pray, in his heart, in his life. Heal him in his body. We pray it. And heal him in his heart. And everybody else that's praying, Lord, I ask that you'll move upon them. I pray that when they're praying right now, your spirit will bear witness with their spirit that they are your children. That you will move upon them. That you, God, that you, God, will move upon them right now. Move, I pray. I have decided. To follow Jesus. If you're at this altar, I just want you to stand with me right now. I have decided. I want you to stand with me a moment. To follow Jesus. I have decided. To follow Jesus. No turning back, no turning back. The cross before me, this is the last verse. The world behind me, make that your confession. The cross before me, the world behind me the cross before me the world behind me no turning back no turning back can you say praise the Lord thank you Lord for what you're doing Thank you, Jesus, that you're working in my heart and working in my... Come on, congregation. Let's let them know they made the right choice today. We celebrate together. We celebrate together. Praise God. There's a gentleman here this morning, and I'm not going to point him out. I prayed with him a moment ago. They've been watching us online and uh, talked to him on the phone, him the other morning for probably about 30 minutes, him and his wife about 30 minutes the other evening. They even put up with me ordering McDonald's for the kids. <laughs> and, uh, but he said, you know, he'd been diagnosed with some, with some things in his body. And uh, he said, we're coming to church Sunday. I said, well, I'm going to pray with you. And we're going to believe God to heal you in your body. You're going to serve the Lord for a little bit longer here in this world. How many know that's going to happen? I want you to agree with him. Will you do it? Come on, let's praise God for what he's doing. Hallelujah. All right. I need you to find your seat. We've got a few people that are going to be baptized. If you're being baptized, I want you to come. I know it's getting late, but it's not, it's not too late for this. That's for sure. So we're going to have some people get baptized here, and we're excited about it. Thank you for playing, my brother. Well, thank you, Jesus. Do you have your change of clothes for after or, or now? Okay. Okay. I'm going to prepare myself here.